Collins from the Welsh Government, who's going to be talking about the experience of considering both health and socioeconomic harms of the pandemic in Wales. So thank you, Brendan. Yes. Um, so hopefully you can hear me through the slides. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. brilliant. So Borada, good morning, everyone. So my name is Brendan Collins. I'm Head of Health Economics in the Welsh Government. Um, so I work kind of across public health, which is the happy science, and economics, which is the dismal science. Um, some disclaimers, so these are my own opinions, not those of my employers. Any data here is in the public domain. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the Welsh Government Technical Advisory Cell and the five harms approach that we've taken. Talk about COVID as a syndemic, um, how we've used data and evidence, health and economic harms, and talk a bit about trade-offs between equity and efficiency. So the Welsh um, Government Technical Advisory Cell COVID-19 was built up in response to the pandemic. Um, it's chaired by Dr. Rob Orford and Phyllis Benet. And the focus was to look at the five harms of COVID. So we kind of call ourselves the Welsh Sage, but we're kind of a lot, a lot smaller than Sage, but I think we've got a bit of a broader remit as well. So we're considering all of these different harms. And we've got a number of subgroups, including policy modeling subgroup, which I chair, um, a risk communication and behavioral insights subgroup, and a socioeconomic harm subgroup, which was chaired by the chief economist in Welsh government. As you probably know, Wales has got the future, um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which requires public bodies to think about the long term impact of decisions and prevent persistent problems such as poverty, health inequalities, and climate change. And um, Public Health Wales have worked with the World Health Organization on the Wealth, Welsh Health Equity Status Report Initiative, which is um, to produce reports for policymakers around health equity in Wales, and they've produced the report around, um, around the pandemic. So these are the five harms. You're probably familiar with this, or, or at least maybe with kind of four harms, um, but they sometimes differ in definitions. So these, these are what we've used as our definitions. So you've got harms directly arising from um, COVID infections. So this might be things like people ending up in hospital, critical care, people sadly dying from COVID. Um, you've got number two is indirect harms due to pressures on the health and social care system, such as um, postponement of elective surgeries or um, different sort of health procedures being missed. Number three, you've got harms arising from population-based health protection measures, such as stay-at-home stay orders. So you've got educational harm, which we've been um, talked about this morning, psychological harm, isolation, etc. Number four is economic harms, such as unemployment and reduced business income. And then number five is harms arising from how COVID has exacerbated existing or introduced new inequalities in society. Um, so this fifth harm kind of cuts across all the other four harms. And when we've been sort of providing our scientific advice in, in the TAC in Wales, we've tried to consider all of these different harms. So in terms of providing scientific advice, there's this kind of handshake between research and policy. And I think it's thinking about where evidence does not exist as well and using evidence in a different way. So some of the big debates we might have had would be around things like face coverings. And I think it's not simply using a sort of evidence-based medicine paradigm, but thinking further. So if you're you're planning say road bridges then you don't do a randomized controlled trial where you build two road bridges you kind of try to get the physics right the first time and so it's thinking about different types of evidence and i think research and policy sometimes are kind of thinking fast and slow they move at different rhythms but i think they've worked well together very well in in the pandemic so covid has been described as a syndemic so this is where um you've got a disease that acts in a synergistic way on top of other risk factors and patterns of disease so classic example is um, TB and HIV. So a lot of countries that are badly affected by TB are also badly affected by HIV. And we've got different types of risk factors. So there's clinical risk factors like high blood pressure, COPD, um, heart disease, behavioral risk factors like smoking, diet, um, exercise, and then risk factors around place. So if you're in overcrowded housing or um, if you live in a deprived area, and there's different theories about health inequalities. So what causes health inequalities? Is it kind of neo-material, not actually having enough resource for a good life? Or is it psychosocial, cultural power theories of health inequalities? And I think the story of the pandemic has been a story about people who, if you don't have a house, you don't have a garden, you don't have a car, you don't have money in the bank, um, you're not in a stable relationship, if you're in precarious um, sorts of employment, then it's been a very different pandemic than, than if you have those things. And there's been sort of shadow pandemics as well that have been hidden. So 
sort of pandemics of epidemics of violence against women and children that have been um, hidden by some of the kind of measures through the pandemic. So this is a slide around poverty in Wales. Um, and I think probably, if anything, a lot of these indicators are get, getting a bit worse over time. So I think we've probably got more people um, in fuel poverty, for instance, at the moment. Um, 180,000 children live in poverty. You can see Wales has got lower median pay. Um, and it's got different population groups that are more likely to experience poverty in Wales. So this is groups like lone parents, minority ethnic groups, families where there's someone with a disability, and people living in rural and coastal regions. And what we see is um, you've got kind of these are also intersecting risk factors for COVID outcomes. So you might have someone who lives in overcrowded housing. Um, they might have pre-existing health condition like COPD. Um, they might work in something that might be a hospital cleaner where um, they're sort of exposed to the virus and maybe maybe initially didn't get the same kind of PPE as well as other, other clinical staff. Might be in an at-risk age group. Um, they might be a carer for someone. So it's thinking about how these different risk factors interact. Um, and sometimes you might have intersectional effects where risk factors are protective. So it might be that if people are in several different groups that, that it can have a protective effect sometimes as well. So I think trying to understand more about more about this is quite important in terms of the policy response to the pandemic. Um, so you can see here example of mortality rate. Mortality is nearly twice as high in the most deprived and the least deprived quintile in Wales. And we've looked at data in Wales, so we worked with a data science consultancy, Armacuni, to develop our COVID dashboards. And I think the amount of data and the frequency is, is unprecedented, really, in the pandemic. And we've seen some examples of that this morning. We've got amazing data um, that has been stood up in response to the pandemic. But some of this is kind of winding down now as we've not got as much testing and things like that. But we're thinking about how we sweat the, that asset, I guess, in trying to triangulate and understand the relationship between different metrics. And there's been innovations around things like contact survey data, wastewater, mobility. You know, you've got um, Yankee Candle reviews where people are saying they can't smell their Yankee Candles. Might, might be a sign of um, anosmia in the population. So this is an um, example of some of the slides from our COVID situational report that we um, published. Um, so this is kind of powered with data from our dashboards and from all different um, sources that we get. And it's aimed to be a concise summary of um, sort of situational awareness data to inform policymakers, so ministers and people in the NHS around what's happening with the pandemic. We've also stood up the COVID-19 Evidence Centre. Now, I mean, there's been a huge volume of evidence that's been produced in the pandemic. Um, a lot of preprints where sometimes it's hard to assess the quality. The Wales COVID Evidence Centre was set, set up to ensure that we get um, good evidence. So a lot of what they do is kind of evidence synthesis, but they also do more kind of primary research, especially using the FAIL data bank. And it's got this remit of good questions answered quickly. So these are some example reviews um, that I think are relevant to socioeconomic harm. So these are either pieces of work that have been completed or pieces of work that are in progress from the Wales COVID Evidence Centre. Um, so you've got things like innovations to address inequalities experienced by women and girls, the impact of restrictions on children, innovations to improve the surgical back backlog, um, adverse effects of infection control measures in care homes, so looking at the sort of well-being effects of um, some of the measures that have been in place in care homes. Um, mental health of health and social care workers, so thinking about sort of burnout and um, post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that in health and social care workers who have been in very difficult circumstances through the pandemic. Um, alternative met um, education strategies, so where face-to-face -face education hasn't been possible in um, different clinical um, Education has had to move to use different things. Um, barriers and facilities is the back vaccine uptake and long COVID. So we've got ongoing work around the health and social care costs of long COVID and quality of life um, impacts of long COVID as well. And what we want with this evidence is it, for it to inform kind of integrated impact assessment, so balancing health and economic harms. Now, a lot of the time, less COVID means a stronger economy. So th there's not a kind of not always that trade-off there's not, not always a dichotomy between sort of controlling the virus and and opening up and letting people have a stronger economy but i think there are sometimes trade-offs and this is partly a technical process and partly a subjective process so you can partly do it with data but it's partly sort of falls to decision makers i think to, to weigh those different impacts in, in the modeling work that we've done in wales we've tried to evaluate gva impacts so gross value added impacts versus the stringency of restrictions versus health outcomes so looking at 
COVID hospitalizations and deaths and long COVID and things like that. And we've got healthcare costs and quality adjusted life years hard coded in our models for Wales, um, which means we get those outputs from our models, which are produced by Professor Mike Graver and his colleagues at Swansea University. With these outputs, I think the value of the quality makes a big difference. So the treasury value each quality at £60,000, the health production cost in the NHS might be £15,000, so it's a lot lower. So it's thinking about what is displaced by these activities. If you're spending money on one thing rather than something else, or nice, um, you can put it as value and quality at £30,000. And we've got complex systems. So there's, there's a kind of interplay between individual behaviours and government interventions. So there's research from the United States looking at different states that um, had different approaches around kind of lockdown. So some states had more stay at home orders, whereas other states had a more relaxed approach. But what they found was that even in states where there was a more relaxed approach, people were still kind of staying, staying at home and being cautious. So sometimes um, it's not always the government intervention that makes all of the difference. And I think it's thinking about how do we achieve cycles of health, human capital and employment? So there's this um, report that came out yesterday by Michael Marmot and colleagues around um, what businesses can do to reduce health inequalities, which I thought was really good. And thinking about what is the cost of one COVID case versus the economic harm of, of different um, restrictions or the economic cost of different interventions. So this is the trend in employment rate for UK versus Wales. So um, you can see Wales has consistently been a bit lower than the UK average and was also quite hard hit by the, by the pandemic towards the right hand of the chart. So this is the estimated social cost of a COVID case. Um, so we estimated that in December 2020 for every COVID case, including the sorts of things that happen afterwards, so hospital admissions and deaths, long COVID, the average cost of this was around £13,000, whereas in July 2021 it was more like £2,500. And there's a shift from mortality to morbidity making up the majority of these costs. So you can see in December 2020, which was just before the vaccination programme started to roll out, he had three deaths per 100 cases. Whereas in July 2021, you had less than half a death per 100 cases. But our estimate of long COVID, you can still see there's still quite a bit of that dark blue. So there's still quite a few cases that result in, in long COVID, which has its own kind of costs and quality losses, which are very still very uncertain at the moment, but we tried to model them. In terms of balancing these different kind of costs and um, outcomes, there's a study that I'm involved with around um, multi-objective optimization of economics and public health. So it's trying to balance different factors around um, restrictions and, and other interventions in a pandemic. So this is just an example here you've got kind of the economic cost of different scenarios versus the infection rate. And what it's looking for is kind of optimal sort of scenarios around um, restrictions and things like that that would um, produce the biggest impact in terms of infections and the biggest impact in terms of um, not having high economic costs. And this is a piece of work that we're just starting out with really, so I'm um, still, still kind of getting off the ground at the moment. So it's the kind of thing that will hopefully be useful in the next pandemic if, um, if this is kind of towards the end of this pandemic that we would hope. And I think understanding the sort of equity impact of COVID policies is important as well. That's been spoken about a bit by um, different people this morning. So low income groups are less likely to get tested and self-isolate, um, less likely to get vaccinated. Just that in ethnic groups are sort, sort of um, more likely to have severe outcomes of COVID and have to um, go out to work. And I think methods like distributional cost effectiveness analysis, so this is something that um, Professor Richard Cox in New York has really kind of um, been one of the key people to, to develop. Um, so thinking about different interventions and programmes on the equity impact plane. So this is a bit like if you've seen kind of a classic kind of cost effectiveness plane in health economics where you've got costs on one axis and, and outcomes on another axis, which might be quality just to life years, qualities. And um, this, is, this is similar to that, except it shows um, the equity impact on one axis and then the, the kind of measure of the net health benefit or net monetary benefit, the total health impact on another axis. And what we're looking for with this is whether um, different programmes or interventions sit in the win-win quadrant. So whether both cost effective, but also reducing health inequalities. And I think that this is what we need to kind of think about in future with different interventions. And this is an example of um, a study that, that used this. So this was looking at um, public health interventions that have been um, recommended by NICE. So this is by Susan Griffin and colleagues. And what they found was for all of the um, public health interventions that have been modelled for NICE over the years, 
um, since they started modeling public health interventions, around 52% were in this kind of win-win quadrant. So they were both reducing health inequalities and cost effective. And I think this is what we're aiming for. And I think ultimately it's thinking about having a win-win portfolio of interventions. So not all interventions will be a win-win. There's always going to be some interventions that um, might be cost effective but don't reduce health inequalities. But I think if we can aim for our portfolio to be kind of sitting mainly in the win-win quadrant, then that might be what we would want. So things like smoking cessation, if it's well targeted, would probably sit in the win-win quadrant. Whereas something like bowel cancer screening, if it's taken up more by affluent populations than deprived populations, then that might sit more in the win-win, in, sorry, the win-lose quadrant where it's cost effective, but it's not reducing health inequalities. So I think it's thinking about that balance really. And there's examples of um, where health inequalities have been reduced, so it's not impossible to reduce health inequalities at population level. So classic example is German reunification. So um, when East and West Germany um, reunified after 1990, there was a um, reduction in health inequalities between the East and the West, and there was a lot of investment that went into East Germany. But, um, there's also this example of the English health inequalities strategy. So you can see the red lines show absolute and relative difference um, in mortality rates, sorry, in life expectancy. Um, and you can see that they do show a dip during the time towards the end of the health inequality strategy. But then unfortunately, um, the gap increases again um, after, after the um, health inequality strategy finished. So I think there are examples of where health inequalities have been successfully um, impacted on at a population level. This is an example of um, work that we did in Methotipville. So this is a quite a deprived local authority that was really hard hit by the pandemic. And it was selected as an area to um, pilot mass testing. And in terms of the um, health economics, we found that it was cost effective with an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of around £2,000 per quality gains. Um, so I think this is quite a good example, really, of um, that kind of local intervention. However, this is when wild type and alpha were the dominant variants and before vaccination rollout. So um, it was a kind of different time. And if you were to do it now, I think it probably wouldn't be cost effective anymore. Also, uptake wasn't equitable within the local authority, so it wasn't necessarily reducing inequalities within the local authority. But I think there's this kind of question around granularity. So what level do you act at? If you're acting in a deprived area, then you might still be reducing the health inequalities between that area and somewhere else. But then within that deprived area, the deeper you delve, you might still not be reducing health inequalities within it. So that was a bit of a kind of whistle stop tour, I guess, of the, the kind of work that we've done in Wales and some of the considerations that we've that we've had throughout the pandemic. I think some future considerations here are things like the NHS balance and recovery and preparedness. So recovery in terms of the elective backlog and people whose needs have not, not always been well met during the pandemic, but also being prepared for future surges of COVID or other viruses. And I think there's issues around social care capacity that have been really illuminated by the, the pandemic. So there's been some times when we've had 600 patients in hospital with COVID, but over a thousand patients who are delayed transfers of care who are waiting to leave hospital with, for a care package. And I think, yeah, it's really highlighted around the structural issues around social care, I guess. Um, educational losses and, and the equity impact of these. So you might have time poor parents who are not able to really kind of help their children to catch up. And there's estimates that um, children lose around 1,600 in earnings for each week of face-to-face -face school that's been missed. I think there's a new understanding of winter viruses in general, so we need better infection prevention and control, including PPE and ventilation in all different buildings. We need to think about long COVID and other sequelae of COVID infection, like um, increased diabetes and CVD. We need to think in general about the fitness of the population. So um, NCMP data for England has been a big increase in child obesity and a big increase in inequalities in child obesity. And there's questions around deconditioning. So if you've got older population, um, who've been at home just kind of losing that fitness really and COVID isn't isn't you know COVID isn't the only sort of problem that we've got at the moment so we've got a kind of multi-crisis at the moment where you've got war in Ukraine you've got inflation fuel and food poverty um, climate change and sustainability and think, thinking about health as part of a foundational economy as well so promoting fair and good work so to summarize um, COVID has exacerbated inequalities and created some new ones I think that um, government scientific, local and community response has been unprecedented. So you've had different disciplines working together. Um, so for instance, you've got kind of economists working with epidemiologists to build these kind of combined models that take into account the complex dynamics that we've got between 
um, people's behaviours and health outcomes and the economy. And I think we need to take the best elements of this and use it to build back better and look at equity impacts of government policies in more detail in future. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, if you could just stop sharing your screen and then I can better see people's hands. Um, while you all are thinking, perhaps I, I was interested in, could, could you speak a little bit about how it was organized within the Welsh government to bring together the epidemiological and economic modeling, which seems a little bit different from how it happened at the UK level, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm the, I was the health economist, so I was kind of the, just happened to be there and be a lot involved in, in COVID modeling. And um, so I was keen to include those health economic parameters in, in the models that we had. Um, and we worked with, with um, Professor Mike Grave and his team at Swansea University were kind of producing their models for Welsh Government, which are based on the London School of Hygiene and Medicine models. Um, so it was trying to have those parameters in there. I think, you know, they're probably still not not perfect and there's still huge uncertainty around some of the parameters particularly things like long COVID and we're still it's still a work in progress so I think what we want to have is parameters around indirect health harms as well so for every person in a, in a hospital bed with COVID how many elective um, admissions are cancelled and things like that understanding that but it's, it's not always a kind of straightforward relationship as well I think what we had was a lot of um, treatment cancelled at the start of the pandemic and then things have changed over time but, um, but yeah, so it's kind of, I guess, we had a policy modelling subgroup and we had a socioeconomic harm subgroup and I was part of them both. So I suppose it's kind of that, that um, interplay between the different groups. No, oh, thank you. Um, Matt Katz. Hey, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly about how did your cost effectiveness analysis take into account uh, potential future waves or variants? Um, because, you know, while, while a, a vaccine might be worth a certain amount under Omicron, say, if you get a new wave which has got more severity, it's going to be worth a differing amount. Yeah, we're not there yet with that. That's something that we want to do. But yeah, there'll be huge, there'll be huge uncertainty, as I say. So, yeah, I think that's one of the key questions at the moment is, I guess, is what is the optimal deployment of vaccines over time in the next in the next few years? I think we've probably got lucky with Omicron that it's not as intrinsically severe as um, previous variants, but we might not get lucky ne next time. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question. And I think with the cost effectiveness of vaccines as well, you know, cost, vaccines have been procured at a UK level, but it's also thinking about the opportunity cost of all of the time to, um, the, to implement it as well, particularly thinking about primary care time. If we've only got so many primary care staff and they're, they're doing vaccines, then that means they're not doing other things like managing long-term conditions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brendan. And um, hopefully if you catch any questions in the chat, um, you can follow up with those. Um, so now we're going to hear from Kaveh Jahan Shahi from the Office for National Statistics, who's going to be speaking about understanding community level risk factors through spatially aggregated COVID-19 risk modeling. 